When it comes to abdominal wall blocks, we're confronted by the paradox of choice. There are multiple locations and block techniques that have been described. Which do we choose to do and how do we choose? What we need to do is match the block technique to the surgery in terms of what the surgery involves and what the block is expected to cover. There are four key questions to ask. First, is visceral analgesia and blockade important? Visceral pain is the pain that the patient with acute pancreatitis or appendicitis feels. It's pain from trauma or inflammation of the internal organs. This is separate and different from somatic pain, which comes from trauma to the abdominal wall, the skin, muscles, fascia, and parietal peritoneum. The surgical incisions, basically. It's easy to focus on sources of somatic pain because they're the most visible, but visceral pain can be a major contributor depending on the specific pathology in surgery. To block visceral pain, we must understand the pathway of transmission. The sensory afferent fibers from internal viscera travel on the same nerves as sympathetic efferents, which is why autonomic plexi, such as the celiac plexus, are targets for so-called sympathetic blocks in conditions like cancer pain. However, we can also block the visceral sensory afferents where they converge with the somatic afferents fibers that transmit sensation from the abdominal wall and which are carried in the intercostal nerves. This convergence occurs in the dorsal root ganglion and the spinal nerve root. Thus, in order to provide visceral analgesia, we need to perform a paraneuraxial block such as paravertebral blocks or an intertransverse process plane block like the ESP or ITP block. This produces local anesthetic spread to the dorsal root ganglion and thus both visceral and somatic analgesia. More peripheral blocks distal to the dorsal root ganglion will provide only somatic analgesia. The second question to ask is, where are the major incisions in the abdominal wall? Different surgeries involve different incisions, but sometimes even the same surgery might involve different incisions depending on the exact approach that's being used. Here, understanding the innervation of the abdominal wall, but more importantly, the course of the nerves that innervate it is vital. The abdomen is innervated by the spinal and intercostal nerves of T6 to T12. They can be blocked with paravertebral or paraneuraxial techniques at the appropriate thoracic vertebral level. This proximal site of blockade targets the main intercostal nerve trunk and thus will also block the lateral cutaneous branches of the intercostal nerves, which arise at the angle of the rib in the posterior to mid axillary line, ascend through the intercostal muscles and the abdominal wall muscles, and then run forward on the superficial surface of external oblique muscle. This detailed dissection study of thoracoabdominal nerves by Sakamoto et al. illustrates the innervation of external oblique muscle by branches that come off of the lateral cutaneous nerves. And we see this even in Netta's Atlas of Anatomy images. What's often overlooked, however, is that the deeper muscle layer of internal oblique muscle in the lateral torso is actually innervated by multiple perforating branches that come off the intercostal nerve as it travels forward between the two muscles. And the same is true of transversus abdominis muscle. This is an important anatomical point as it explains why we can still see meaningful analgesia of the anterolateral torso with some abdominal wall blocks even when our local anesthetic does not specifically surround these lateral cutaneous nerve branches. The anterior terminal branches of intercostal nerves emerge at the costal margin into the tap plane between internal oblique and transversus abdominis. Local anesthetic injected into this tap plane at or anterior to the mid axillary line will block these nerves and provide analgesia of the anterior abdominal wall, including the superficial cutaneous tissues. This local anesthetic in the tap plane will, however, not spread to or surround the lateral cutaneous branches, which are lying in the superficial plane above external oblique, and thus we will not see detectable cutaneous sensory block of the lateral abdominal wall. However, as we've just discussed, the local anesthetic in this tap plane will anesthetize the deeper muscular tissues of internal oblique and transversus abdominis in this lateral region since they are supplied by branches from the anterior terminal intercostal nerves. 
Blocks targeting the tap plane can still therefore provide some degree of analgesia to incisions that extend to the anterior axillary line or mid axillary line, depending on how far posteriorly the local anesthetic spreads. It's also a useful practical framework to think in terms of supraumbilical and infraumbilical incisions in coverage, shown here with the two different colors. With the supraumbilical region innervated by T7 to T10 and the infraumbilical region by T10 to T12, with contribution to the inguinal area by L1. And this is because the different abdominal wall block techniques tend to more reliably cover either the supraumbilical or infraumbilical area. It's difficult to cover both with a single technique. Bilateral blocks are also required for incisions that are in or crossing the midline due to crossover innervation. Note that the L1 branches, the ilioinguinal and iliohypogastric nerves, have a different anatomical course from the other thoracoabdominal nerves. They emerge from the lateral border of psoas major, run over the anterior surface of quadratus lumborum muscle, and initially run deep to transversus abdominis for a variable distance before ascending into the tap plane between transversus and internal oblique muscles. They pop up through external oblique muscles after a short and variable course in the tap plane, and as a result, they are sometimes missed with lateral or posterior tap blocks. If they are of primary interest, they are best blocked either posteriorly where they lie deep to transversus abdominis muscle, using either the transversalis fascia plane or TFP block, or more anteriorly in the region of the ASIS, anterior superiorly spine, with an ilioinguinal iliohypogastric block. The third question to ask is what block is feasible to perform? Note that for most abdominal wall blocks, coagulopathy is not considered to be a major contraindication. If surgeons can operate, we can do these blocks. Rather, the main issues with feasibility have to do with technical performance. Can this patient be placed in a position to do the block? Paraneuraxal blocks require access to the back, so this means a sitting or lateral position, whereas the other blocks can be done with the patient supine. What is the extent of the surgical field and associated dressings? This also has to take into account the proposed timing of the block. If we're going to insert catheters preoperatively, they need to stay out of the surgical field. And if contemplating a single injection block, on one hand, you could do it preoperatively to maximize perioperative opioid sparing, but on the other hand, you could also make an argument for doing it at the end of surgery, sacrificing the intraoperative benefit in order to maximize postoperative duration of analgesic effect. If we're going to perform the block postoperatively, we once again have to think about our ability to position the patient before or after emergence, the likely obstacles such as stoma sites, wound dressings, and the possibility that there may be disruption of the target fascial planes by the surgical dissection with air, blood, and other fluid. The fourth and final question what is the desired duration of regional analgesia? Any single injection of local anesthetic, be it by the surgeon or by ourselves, will have a finite duration. Now with surgical wound infiltration, this is usually only several hours at best. Abdominal wall blocks do better than this, with the literature indicating that we can obtain 10 to 12 hours benefit on average, but still almost always less than 24 hours. So if significant surgical pain and wound healing is going to last longer than that, as in the major laparotomy, we should be considering a continuous catheter technique. This introduces other considerations. Some abdominal wall blocks lend themselves better to catheters than others. And unlike with a thoracic epidural, we usually require bilateral catheters to ensure adequate coverage across the midline. Automated dosing by continuous infusion or intermittent boluses will generally also require two pumps, which increases the complexity of the setup and the nursing. An alternative is manual intermittent boluses by the acute pain service team, but this will increase their workload. For further information on specific techniques, you'll find plenty of online material that demonstrates them. One of my favorite sources is the YouTube channel masterminded by Jeff Gadsden out of Duke University's Anesthesiology Department, which has fantastic videos that are both brief and informative. I've curated some of this content into a playlist on my channel that also has some of my own videos. Links are in the description to this video.